Okay, uh, thank you very much. I'd like to begin by thanking all the organizers, Arvin, Ridhipati, Manjunath, and all the others for inviting me to this meeting. Uh, I'm not an expert in most parts of this meeting, and perhaps you're not experts in most of what I'm going to say. So please feel free to interrupt during my talk. If you have any questions, ask them whenever they arise. Okay. I will talk today about universal properties of the spatio-temporally chaotic state of the one-dimensional kuramoto sivashinsky equation. I will also tell you eventually uh, what this has to do with the main uh, uh, themes that have been covered in this meeting. Uh, this uh, work would have been impossible uh, without Dipankar Roy, who's done all the hard work. He's sitting up there, which also means he will answer all the hard questions. And uh, I would like to thank uh, DST, CSR, and UGC for their generous support over the years for various uh, aspects of my research. Okay, here is an outline of the talk. I will begin by things which look really different from what I'm going to talk about. This is to give you the setting of this problem. It's a general background. That is, that there are many systems and of course uh, it affects all our lives turbulence you know every flow you walk along you're walking through a turbulent flow so there's a long history of you know studying the statistical properties of turbulence and as all of you know uh, this is done by using a celebrated partial differential equation called the navier-stokes equation so there is a long history again going back at least to 1964 saying that can we learn something about these statistical properties by looking at related stochastic partial differential equations. So I will begin first with a small historical interlude uh, about the, this problem in the Navier-Stokes setting. I will then introduce you to the deterministic kuramoto sivashinsky partial differential equation, and I want you to note the word deterministic. And then I will uh, uh, give you reasonable evidence, which has been around for a while, that the statistical properties of the stochastic PDE, the celebrated kardar parisi zhang or KPZ equation, are, as far as we can tell, akin to those in uh, the solutions of the kuramoto sivashinsky equation. Um, I am certainly not mathematically strong enough to prove this. I would like to believe that at the moment nobody is, but we will provide you with compelling numerical evidence for the statement that I just made, and then I think that is a nice way of trying to collaborate with mathematicians and then I will end with conclusions. So that's a sort of quick overview of the talk. Now, all of you know that uh, fluid flows are governed by the Navier-Stokes equation, which I have written here, okay? U is the Eulerian velocity, P is the pressure, nu is the kinematic viscosity, rho is the density, which we can take to be one because we will restrict ourselves to incompressible flows for which the divergence of u is zero, right? Now this term on the right, f is the forcing term. And typically, uh, you know, in, uh, in the physical world, I mean, you stir water in a bucket, you are forcing the system at the largest spatial scales. Or if Mark is doing the simulation on a computer, he will put in something called Taylor-Green forcing, which is forcing at small wave number or at uh, large length scales. But that is typically deterministic forcing, or at least some prescribed function. But you can also envisage random forcing. And this, as far as I can tell, was first uh, suggested by Sam Edwards, uh, who wrote a paper in JFM called the Randomly Forced Navier-Stokes Equation. And this force was then, uh, I don't know whether he had exactly the same notations as I do, 
uh, was is I, I'm okay. Excuse me for interrupt. Uh, I'm writing this in Fourier space. So being a naive physicist, I take Fourier transforms and I specify all these statistical properties in Fourier space. So the mean, zero mean forcing, k is now a wave vector, t is time. And then uh, this force is delta correlated in time, delta correlated in space. I've put in a mysterious looking factor here. This is the transverse projector, if I got it all right. And that enforces incompressibility. And uh, I have put in not white in time, excuse me. I have allowed for the possibility of some coloring in space, so k to some power p. If you said that p equal to zero, then okay, it's just straightforward, okay? Which is probably what Edwards had, all right? I will also remind you that there is the, given some viscosity, given some forcing, the natural control parameter is the dimensionless measure of advection to dissipation, which is the Reynolds number, U is a typical velocity, L is a typical length scale, divided by the kinematic viscosity in U. This is dimensionless. And the higher the Reynolds number, the more the turbulence. And we are interested eventually in the statistical properties of the turbulent but statistically steady state that obtains when you force a fluid in this way. So more history. By 1977, uh, the renormalization group had been invented, and it had also been applied uh, to the, uh, you know, the critical properties of time-dependent correlation functions at critical points. In a celebrated paper in 1977, Forster, Nelson, and Stephen went back to this problem, excuse me, and with this uh, stochastic force, they actually use renormalization group methods to tell us about the statistical properties, not only of the randomly forced Navier-Stokes equation, uh, but also of the randomly forced Berger's equation. And indeed, uh, oh, anybody who wants the slides, I can give them to you, no problem. Uh, if, you, if you like, uh, the KPZ renormalization group is also in this paper, if you, if you go back and look at history. All right, so that was that, but it wasn't real turbulence, and this was, I think, first recognized by de Dominicius and Martin, who did the same renormalization group, but now with a forcing where there was a finite power of k. Okay, and if I get my factors right, for k to the minus d of uh, plus d forcing, they could, at what we would now call a one-loop level, get the celebrated minus five-thirds law for the energy spectrum due to Kolmogorov. And then various other people followed, Fournier and Frisch, Yakhot and Orsag, and joined Bhattacharji from Kolkata, who did some very interesting work, and so on. And, you know, if you want to get really feel theoretical, this group uh, in St. Petersburg. Of course, for those of you who know about turbulence, you know that the scaling is not simple minus five-thirds scaling. There are corrections, which are called multi-scaling. And I believe I'm correct in saying that we were the first to check this numerically. Again, nothing can be proved analytically. And then we could show that, uh, you know, you, you do get multi-scaling in this randomly forced model, which, given whatever numerical resolution we have, and this has been confirmed in subsequent uh, studies, is the same as in turbulence in the deterministically forced Navier-Stokes equation. Now, perhaps all of you have been told that uh, fluid turbulence is too hard. So can we do a simpler problem? Okay, this doesn't look too simple, actually. This is flame front propagation. I give you some uh, you know, pictures which you have seen in the current news flame front propagation, California wildfires, then some things that you might not have seen, chemical wave patterns, there are some uh, interfaces here that are growing, or thin fluid film flowing down a wall. Now, if you're completely honest fluid dynamically, uh, these are described, say the flames, are described by very complicated equations, including Navier-Stokes, 
plus equations for the um, you know, chemical components, different types of fuels, and people spend their lifetimes doing it. We have a center for combustion research in our institute where people study this in a very serious way. But if you look at the simplest flame front model, and this was realized, I think, by Kuramoto and Suzuki in 76, and by Sivashinsky in, in an astro astronomical setting in 79, there is a, at least a much, much, much simpler partial differential equation that you can write down for the flame front. And now we have simplified the description to such an extent that we are going to pretend that the flame front is described by a height variable h. This can be written down in any number of dimensions. I'm going to write it only in one because that's the dimension in which I will concentrate. So uh, already those of you who are experts at KPZ will begin to see some similarity. So hxt is the interfacial height profile and the system has side L. Now, if you were thinking Navier-Stokes, etc., you might have had a coefficient in front, which would be like a viscosity. Another one here, which in the jargon of fluid dynamics would be a hyperviscosity, and so on. And you can see the same KPZ nonlinearity. I'm not going to derive this equation. That's in the old text. But I want to say that if you, even if you put in all those coefficients, you can scale them out in some suitable way by scaling field, space, and time, so that the only control parameter left at this level of description is the system size L, the linear system size L, okay? And as you might guess, if L is large, this system can show complicated behavior in the jargon of the trade, uh, uh, spatiotemporal chaos, which is turbulence for this model. Now you might ask, where's the forcing? There's no forcing term here. But those of you who are keeping track of every sign will note that this diffusion term has a wrong sign, all right? And then this higher order term is what controls the instability. So um, at the linear level, if you asked for growth of perturbations and plotted it in, uh, in some Fourier space, if I get things right, if I call the growth omega of k versus k, then it'll look something like this, all right? And all these wave numbers are unstable. So left to itself, this is linearly unstable. And it so turns out that as far as anyone can tell, this nonlinearity scrambles up the modes, okay? Mixes them up, and the system attains a spatio-temporally chaotic state for L sufficiently large. People actually have studied it as a function of L to see a whole bunch of transitions, and eventually you get a statistically steady state, right? And over the years, uh, okay, let me first show you what it looks like, okay? Uh, so for some initial condition, which I am not specifying at the moment, so in this movie that I'm about to show, H is on the vertical axis, one axis is X, and you're seeing it evolving in time, and you see that that interface is becoming more and more complicated given our sign convention, it is going downwards, and it is a very complicated interface. All right, and this is a fairly low resolution, uh, low by Mark standards anyway. Uh, this is only two to the 16 points in Fourier space, all right? So there is, uh, over the years, this compelling numerical evidence uh, that uh, the statistical properties of this system, of this height field, uh, are in the same universality class as KPZ. Okay, this, uh, I don't know who conjectured it first. Yahut conjectured it based on an argument which might have been uh, wrong in detail insofar as he was expanding about a, an inherently unstable linear theory. And then it was, you know, 
uh, checked by various people, uh, these people Zaleski, and then very nicely by Ayo, Jayaprakash, and Josquin, uh, who uh, showed that if your L is sufficiently large, in particular, there is some crossover length, which is given here, and some crossover time, which is given there. If you look at the statistical properties of this height field, then it crosses over from what is familiar to all of you, Edwards-Wilkinson behavior, which would be uh, no, no nonlinear term, uh, to the KPZ behavior. Okay? I'm not going to give you all the historical data for this. And by the way, incidentally, I should say, yes. No, no, no noise. It generates its own noise. I'm just telling you that if you compare it with what you will get from simulations of KPZ. Not initial, okay, fine. It is it's turbulence. Where does the noise come from in turbulence? Same way. It's dynamically generated. It's chaos, spatiotemporal chaos. It's just like in turbulence. How does it come in a fluid with deterministic forcing? You didn't ask me that when I did Navier Stokes. Right? Same thing. Yeah, you can do that. I will show you a lot. No problem. I'll show them all to you. But what I'm saying is the noise is dynamically generated. I mean, this is the crux of the... Noise, may, uh, sorry, I just mean turbulence. That's what I mean, turbulence. And no external noise, excuse me. Absolutely. Yes, so we can change the... Yeah, no, absolutely, no, no, that's all. Yeah, no, no, no problem. I would only mean uh, uh, in the sense of turbulence. Okay, right? And, uh, all right, uh, the statistical properties will be the same. Okay? Now, there's many, many... I, I should also point out that this is also true in two dimensions. Uh, the analog of this calculation was done by Jayaprakash, Ayo, and me soon after this paper. Uh, there was a bit of a, you know, some people had the opposite view that, uh, you know, it will always be Edwards Wilkinson. It's not. It's just that in two dimensions, because of some technical reasons, which the experts will know, the crossover scales are very, very big. So unless you're very careful, you will miss it. All right? Now, all this, if you look at the old literature, was done with limited resolution. Uh, what my young friend Dipankar has done has to, has done it with uh, state-of-the-art resolution using a code, which I will tell you about soon. But let me show you only one measure of the traditional uh, sort of uh, statistical property that you would measure. This is the analog of the energy spectrum in uh, Navier-Stokes turbulence, which is, would show minus five-thirds in three dimensions. So K squared EK, so-called compensated spectrum, versus K, this is wave number, is like this, okay? This peak here is a vestige of the linear instability. Okay, if you look, you will get structures of the scale which has to do with 2 pi over that. And up here, you will see IC1, IC2. There are six initial conditions which we have looked at. In the old days, people would look at only one or so, and they would be, you know, they would say, look, we get the same exponents as KPZ, uh, which, believe me, if you look at the details, this will also work out. I'm not showing you every detail just now, but I will presently. And you can see that all the different initial conditions that we have show a reasonable range which in turbulence jargon would be called an inertial range, okay? All right. Now, of course, uh, all of you know much more about this equation than I do. This is just for uh, establishing notations and so on. This is the one-dimensional KPZ equation, all right? It looks basically like uh, uh, the kuramoto sivashinsky we just wrote down, but with viscosity of the right sign for stability, that's the standard nonlinearity. Here's the external noise. There's no need to put in the fourth order thing because the noise provides the stochasticity. As I said, uh, 
This was first studied by Kardar, Parisi, and Zhang as a model for a growing surface interface. But if you go back in time, the renormalization group that they used is the same as the one in Forster, Nelson, and Stephen. And it has been found that the behavior of many other related models uh, are the same. You heard in the previous talk about the stochastically forced Burgers equation, where the Burgers velocity u is related to this height field in this manner, uh, directed polymers in a random medium, and so on. Okay, so all this you know well, and uh, there are a lot of papers, reviews from many, many different areas. Okay. Now, in the old days when we used to study this model, and uh, we, you know, said, oh, Kuramoto Sivashinsky looks like uh, KPZ in, if you just look at statistical properties. Uh, we would just say this much. If this is the difference between the heights at the same time, okay, uh, then it's growing at some linearly, and then there is some power, and then we would not worry about this chi, all right? And all, all these would depend on new lambda and d. Then people would look at the width, W sub L of T, for a system of size L as a function of T. So this is like this uh, mean square fluctuations in the height. And they found that it goes as T to the 1 over 2Z. I hope I have all my factors right. Uh, and Z is 3 halves. Okay? And over the years, people have obtained this 3 halves with different levels of uh, rigor. Uh, but... Uh, at this level, all this was checked numerically at the level of the width in the early simulations, which sought to find whether the statistically steady state in the kuramoto sivashinsky equation gave the same power laws as in uh, APZ. But as all of you know far better than I, uh, I guess uh, Prehofer and Spohn taught us that uh, we should look at this function also, chi of xd. As, and it turns out, and this is a complete mystery to someone who comes from normalization group land, that this uh, uh, leftover part, or whatever you want to call it, has probability distribution functions that are different for different initial conditions. For the flat initial condition with some little bump on it, you get the Tracy Widom PDF for the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble in the, uh, I don't know what say, okay, whatever state. Then there's another bike range which you all heard about earlier in the thing, in the statistically stationary state. And then if you have a curved or so called wedge initial condition, uh, you get the Tracy Widom for the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, okay? And there is a strong belief, you have heard about in many of the lectures, the overview lectures, the wonderful ones that we've been having this week, that these universal PDFs should appear in all models in the one-dimensional KPZ universality class. So this level of checking whether the statistically steady state of the kuramoto sivashinsky equation gives these statistics has never been done before. And what we set out to do was to uh, check this. And also, as all of you know, uh, this is related to the statistics of the largest eigenvalue in random matrix theory uh, for uh, GOE or GUE. And often they put a subscript beta on this chi, where beta equal to 1 gives you the GOE, and beta equal to 2 gives you GUE. And this bike range seems to be independent. And uh, uh, I asked in one of the previous talks, is there a good intuitive understanding to see why a given initial condition should be related? And I didn't get uh, uh, a clear answer. Okay, what makes our work possible? Our work is made possible because we are not scared of computers, okay? And so we are happy to do direct numerical simulations. Uh, it helps to use some clever time differencing. So there is this exponential time differencing method, fourth order runge kutta, uh, which is given these two references, right? And then a pseudospectral method. So we get spectral accuracy. What does pseudospectral mean? It means that we go to Fourier space, 
And when we solve this equation in Fourier space, these spatial derivatives are just uh, trivial multiplication by powers of k. And this term, which would be a convolution in Fourier space, we don't do in Fourier space, we do an inverse Fourier transform and bring it back to real space and do that product in real space. Okay, and then go back and forth. And at the same time, keep on maintaining your time integration. And, uh, okay, uh, so we have gone to lengths of size 2 to the 20, n equal to 2 to the 20, which is uh, much, much longer and bigger than any, anything that anyone has done for this particular model, all right? And to get everything right, you have to do two-thirds de-aliasing, which means beyond some uh, Fourier mode k, you should set all h tilde of k to zero, otherwise you get well-known problems, uh, uh, which Mark can tell you about, and you use a periodic boundary conditions. <laughs> n is the number of collocation points. The number of Fourier modes we keep w before we do de-aliasing. After de-aliasing, we will get rid of some of them, all right? Okay, and we run for very, 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 very long hmm, to get good statistics. But even then, you will see what the good things are and what the limitations are. And what makes this possible is, of course, De Poncker, but he also wrote the code in CUDA, C, and we used a machine with graphics GPUs. All right, so there are some well-known things in KPZ land. There's something called family Vichek scaling. Uh, so if you look at the width uh, for a system of size L at early times, it'll go as t to the beta. If you, uh, with some system of size L at large times, uh, so this one should apply here, is L to the alpha. The width is again defined as before. Sub L means an average over spatial extent L. And these alphas and betas should be one half and one third if you have KPZ universality. We can define an asymptotic velocity, which is this, okay, V sub infinity of T. And then you can look at the skewness in kurtosis, which all of you know, I mean, the third moment divided by this, and the fourth moment divided by the second moment squared. And you can also get this rescaled height fluctuations, the PDF of which is the desideratum for us, okay, and suitably scaled with this. So the question for Kuramoto Sivashinsky, do we get all these things in the manner in which they're supposed to behave if they are in the KPZ universality class? So let's look at a wedge initial condition well known to people who study uh, these sorts of problems. What does that mean? That HX as a function of x looks like this wedge, okay? And I showed you a movie which showed you how h evolves in time for all x, but this is not the size of our domain. This is only the central part of our domain. The domain is much, much bigger, but I'm just showing you how the initially this thing, okay, the wedge it looks like a wedge, but it's actually quite mild. And this is how the height function evolves in time as you, as you evolve in time, okay? All right, excuse me. So first, let's check uh, Vichek, uh, family Vichek scaling. So we plot this width as a function of L for some different times, T1, T2, T3, T4, okay? And this is the slope that should be one half. Okay, this is as, uh, as good as it is, okay? I'm not massaging the data. Uh, these are you know, plots at different times. The slope one half would have been this. It's not exactly one half, but probably if you could do a much, much bigger system and so on, probably you would get one half. But I still tell you that at the moment, this is the world record. I mean, nobody has run Kuramoto Sivashinsky in one dimension for so long, and it's uh, such a big thing. In the inset, I show you, uh, this, these are all log-log plots. Most of my plots would be log-log plots unless stated otherwise, uh, to show the power laws. And you can see that the t to the one-third, well, it's limited. 
It's over half a decade, perhaps, if you're kind. But these are real logs. They're all base 10. They're not EKs. They're decades. All right? And then uh, recall that I had defined also this kurtosis and this, this kurtosis and the skewness. Okay? So, yes. So, uh, yeah, so there are both types. Uh, uh, the Ponker is a fixed X, so you average over X also. We have done both, so I don't know which. This is averaged over X, but later we will come back to some relatively fixed X when we look at some more complicated initial conditions. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right, so uh, if... For this initial condition, it is known which Tracy Widom distribution it should be, and therefore uh, that is what the uh, kurtosis should be, that is what the uh, skewness should be, and this is what our data do. Eventually, if you run it long enough, they seem to asymptote to this, but okay, one can run longer, but uh, I would say this is reasonable evidence. And indeed, I mean, if not, this is so far the best evidence in the world for this particular, uh, these particular properties. Okay. Now you can ask, what is the limiting surface distribution for this initial condition? What we have found so far is this. Actually, in the earlier talks, you would see that when people do these uh, growth models and things, this should really be quadratic. Am I right? It should eventually become quadratic, but it's okay. This is the best so far. And then we look at uh, the rescaled height variable here. And this is the PDF of it. And uh, that's the agreement with Tracy Widom GUE. And this is the one which should have given GUE. So uh, not too bad. For, uh, yes, Mark, you have a question? The bump, yeah, yeah, I know. There is this uh, bump. I don't know what this bump is, but it's there. Yes. Yes. Right. No, no, excuse me. He has also averaged over ensemble. So, how did you do the ensemble? This is averaged over what, five? What? So, what did you change to do that ensemble average? Initial condition perturbed a little bit. With a little, yeah, some little uh, stuff on it. Okay, so it's actually, I should have said that also. There's also an averaging over uh, some initial conditions. Not huge, but it, it's not, not one. Okay? All right. So now let's look at initial condition two, which is nominally flat. Flat means with some little dimples on it. Right? Because if it's just flat, then of course it, it won't move. But, but there are some, some uh, uh, okay. And again, you can see that if you evolve it in space and time, you get something complicated. And 100 is only the central part of it that is being shown. All right? So, again, how good are the data? So here is the bare minimum check that you can do, family V check, and slope, more or less one half, not perfect. Perhaps if we had just fit the first few points, it would have been better. But we just didn't want to, okay, we're just showing you that line is there only to guide the eye. It's not an exponent that I'm giving with, uh, you know, uh, error bars and so on. Similarly, the one third. That's as good as it gets in our simulation so far. Uh, here is the uh, kurtosis. Here is the skewness. And though they're in the right ballpark, this is uh, as good as it is. Yeah, this one is GOE, if I'm not to say. Yeah, it is GOE. It's written there, GOE. Okay. And again, this one is done for uh, different times, and so on. Okay. Uh, what is the limiting surface in distribution, which is a quantity of interest in all these models? I think many of you showed such things 
for different models, etc. And this is what it looks like, which is qualitatively what it is supposed to be in this case. And you can ask for this PDF. And again, I think it's not doing too badly. That is the GOE. And okay, there's still this little telltale bump. I don't know what it is. But it's, yeah, it, it's, it, again, averaged over five, five realizations and over space also. Okay, initial condition number three. This is the Brownian, is that correct? Okay. So here is the initial condition. And here is the spatiotemporal evolution. Again, you can see quite complicated. I want to emphasize here that if we just measured the simple KPZ things that we talked about, these would be more or less the same. The spectra that I showed you in the beginning was the same for all these initial conditions. But the measures that we are using now are different, as they should be if we believe that this is in the KPZ class. So again, uh, this is the simple old-fashioned thing, family V-check. That's the one half, that's the one third. So far, no better than that, okay? This might have to do, yeah, sorry? Yes. Can you answer, please? What's the variance of your Brownian motion for the initial condition? Yes. Sure, sure. Yeah, right. Was, what is, what is uh, the, the variance of the initial conditions of the Brownian motion? And the reason why I'm asking is that you have to take one particular variance in order to make it stationary under your flow if you study the KPC equation. So if I take the KPC equation and I just put Brownian motion initial data, it will not be stationary and you will see something different. Only if it's stationary, which fixes, so to speak, the, you know, whenever you fix the other parameter, fixes for you also the variance of the Brownian motion. Now here, of course, um, I mean, yeah, for you it's a free parameter, and so I just wondered, I mean, how you actually pick it. I mean, we will check that. Oh, oh, okay, so I don't want to interrupt. I maybe maybe you can explain later. But because the other question, which is related, is I mean, usually in a, I mean, for other systems, you simply run the system to make it stationary, and then you start measuring. This is maybe something which is difficult in your case. Uh, we run it very long, and only then we make the measurements. We don't start making the measurements. Uh, you know, of course not. Only when it is sort of statistically steady enough, so that when you do this family we check set, etc. But this there into the brand in motion, we will check and then we'll back. Uh, so here the skewness and kurtosis are well, this is what they are. I mean, it's not it's not perfect, even these are not perfect, but it's close. It's not close, uh, it's not okay. All right. And then you can ask what is the limit surface distribution. And you can ask, does this show by cranes? And indeed it does. And I don't have a plot here, probably I should have had it, where for these three different initial conditions, if I had put in the GUE, the GOE, and the by cranes, they would have looked different even to the eye. Okay? So, I mean, there's a similar plot in a paper by Halpin Healy and uh, Sasamoto, perhaps, which has... Uh, uh, these plots, and then they're as different as they are in that thing, okay? So, some things are working out. If you look at full numerical detail, I've shown you what is the level of it. Now, are there, there are other people who say we can do more complicated initial conditions, which are a combination of the two. So, the wedge uh, plus a little bit of, uh, uh, this is uh, just some wedge plus some Brownian on top of a flat, okay? And uh, this is how it evolves. And again, uh, here are uh, the slope, the Vichek family, and here are the, this is the kurtosis, which is going to some value, probably not exactly the same values. You can ask what is the limit surface, and that's the limit surface. This comes from the, uh, the slope part, slope part, and the middle part. And if you look at some papers, there is a paper by Corwin, which has something even for these mixed ones. And the claim is it should be GOE squared. Well, it's not exactly. And then 
by talking to people in this meeting, they said, oh, but it will be GOE squared only if you look around there where the two meet. Okay, so uh, in real time, uh, you know, the bunker did that. And uh, well, again, the data are like this. And okay, somewhat better, but not perfect. So this is after very, very, very long runs. Uh, how, much, how long does one initial condition take to run? Five days? Or, sorry? One week per initial condition is roughly what it is. All right, so then you look at another one, uh, flat and uh, wedge. And um, okay. Again, this is, uh, I would have liked it to be better, but this is as it is. Okay. It, it's not perfect even at the family V check level. And limiting surface, here I don't know, I'm not entirely sure whether the limit distribution is known for this particular initial condition. Is it known analytically? Okay, fine. sorry? I see, okay. Okay, so it's something in between, but it depends on the details. So, so in principle it exists. It's not written in a way that is so transparent that you can just plot it easily, but certainly it is, sorry? Sorry? You can plot it, okay. So please learn how to plot it, even if it's a Fred Hoagland determinant, okay? Uh, excuse me. And so, uh, all right. So again, this was done uh, not uh, the way, uh, you know, all of you mathematicians would have wanted us to do. This was averaged over all of X. So we really, we should look in the regime where they inter uh, intersect. And so again, this has been done. Uh, obviously, when you average over a smaller region, the data are not so good, but this is what it looks like, okay? So uh, this is the last initial condition I want to show you is a combination of Brownian plus flat. Again, the variance of the Brownian we'll look at later. Uh, and again, at some rough level, these exponents are the same. Uh, the <coughs> kurtosis and uh, this are not doing too badly. And this is supposed to be GOE. And okay, uh, the simple ones work out reasonably well. Uh, so that's that. Okay, one last thing uh, before I wind down. Uh, this, I don't know who did it first. Did you do it first? Okay. All right, so this is something that Shotta Mojumdar and his uh, group did. Uh, so if you look at the maximum eigenvalue of this random matrix for the GOE case, GUE case, you can write it like this, and this variable chi beta is chi one for the GOE and chi two for the GUE. And uh, okay. Uh, you can write it like this. It has different asymptotic behaviors in these regimes, which I think we've got right, specified by all this here. And this stands for Tracy Widom. And this gives you the left tail, and this gives you the right tail. All right? And then uh, you can look at the large deviations as a functional, whatever you like to call it. And this is what the right tail does. And this is what the left tail does. And this backslash sim in LaTeX stands for logarithmically equivalent in these two limits. So the question is, are we seeing this? And this uh, Shotto and his collaborators called a third order phrase transition. Do we see this in our kuramoto Sivashinsky simulations? And the answer is yes, again, the sort of uh, accuracy that we have. Over here, for example, you can't see the subscript. Uh, the red is the left tail that is obviously doing better. The blue is the right tail and the curve is the analytical result and the symbols are our data. Uh, and the left plot is for the GOE case and the right plot is for the GUE case. So to the extent that these data are, I don't know, semi-consistent with the analytical results, the kuramoto sivashinsky statistically steady state is also showing this uh, third-order phase transition, if you like. 
Okay. Uh, all these uh, uh, calculations somehow have not been done in Kuramoto Sivashinsky settings, to the best of my knowledge, before. Even though there was a lot done in the early days to show that it was in the same universality class as uh, KPZ, uh, this uh, has never been attempted. So, what I would uh, like to say is that we demonstrate how to obtain all these distributions in the spatio-temporally chaotic state of the 1D kuramoto sivashinsky equation. This is sort of intellectually satisfying. If you're a real critic, you'll say, oh, but your numerical data were only so good. But okay, that, that's what it is. As far as I know, this is the first time that these PDFs have been found in any deterministic partial differential equation which displays spatiotemporal chaos, okay? Uh, where analytical results are available, okay, as in the KPZ case. There is a conjecture due to Quastel and Hira for the 1D KPZ equation that uh, this nonlinear term if you replace it by a polynomial that is even in grad H, then you will get the same sort of universality. So, uh, well, it's quite possible that if you put the same sort of polynomial in a kuramoto sivashinsky or generalized kuramoto sivashinsky equation, you would get the same, but you know, checking it numerically will be a significant challenge, okay? Uh, because the moment you start putting in these higher powers of these gradients, your uh, pseudospectral code will have to be de-aliased better and better, and uh, that will cause you a lot of... Okay, in one of the previous talks, I think you said that uh, we can prove many things, but sometimes we can't prove them for the KPZ. I think proving them for the kuramoto sivashinsky is an even greater challenge. I think uh, the reason some of these stochastically forced equations were used in the fluid turbulence setting is that you could begin to do some sorts of calculations. Depending on your point of view, you can call it one loop self-consistent, you can call it a normalization group, which you cannot do for the deterministic equation. Uh, and, uh, you know, this has got a long history. It goes back to Wilde and Martin Sigia Rose. So you can do that for these stochastic equations. So, but I do not know the sorts of mathematicians we have here. They're already having some difficulty with the stochastic equation, whether they can say anything for the statistically steady state, the spatio temporally chaotic state of this. Uh, deterministic PDE, namely the kuramoto sivashinsky equation. So with that, I thank you, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might still have. So what happens if you do the Hopkoll transformation to this KS equation? Does it reduce to the Diffusion, because you don't have any explicit noise terms, so do you... There is a quartic term, uh, sorry, excuse me, fourth derivative, no? Yeah, what does it do? That's what I'm asking. Did you try that? Uh, uh, but fourth derivative uh, term, it still, it should still be a linear equation, right? Once you do the hop call. Could be, I have to look at it. I think that's been tried, but... Uh, uh, okay, I don't remember offhand is, is a quick answer. You can try it, but... Yeah. But again, sometimes... Uh, Hopkoll would give you a sort of formally exact solution as it does in burgers, and then you can extract things quite finely. And Shamridhi has done many such things in the past. But we haven't tried here. I, I don't think it will help very much. I mean for the KPZ, for the exact solution, yeah. that you do the Hopkoll to reduce it to a heat equation? With the no, no, I, I, I know. I, yeah, of course. Yeah, I know. Uh, of course. Yeah, yeah. But here, I don't think there's any exact solution as far as I know. I mean, this equation is round and, and so on, but I don't think it, it, it helps. Yes. Uh, well. oh, no, it's on. 
Okay. So um, I just want to make one remark. First time that it's a PDF. I mean, I completely agree. And uh, beautiful talk. I mean, you know, it's very impressive. I mean, I know about you know the very early uh, Jakob, and this was sort of. I mean, I mean, it's really quite amazing. No, but I do want to point out. I mean, together with Abhishek and, and other people. Um, you know, we studied um, discrete nonlinear wave equations in one dimension, and that's definitely also spatial temporary chaos. Of course, they are discrete. I mean, so maybe not exactly PDE, but but uh, but uh, what I want to point out, of course, there you also use spatial temporal chaos in order to get KPC behavior. I, I changed my slides last night <laughs> after listening <laughs> okay. to Manas's talk because that is a, also a deterministic system. But uh, okay, uh, that's why I wrote only PDE. Okay, you're right, absolutely. Yeah, no problem. So maybe is, is this a, a correct way to understand? So you start with some initial condition and then you run it for a very long time before you start doing measurements. And then you start with another initial condition which is slight epsilon different from the first one. But then you run it for a very long time and then you start taking measurements. So when you start taking measurements, these are entirely different initial conditions because you have made them evolve for a very long time. So the noise is actually literally in the initial conditions, right? So that's, what I was trying to say. Yeah. that's so, true. Yeah. No, so true. when you want to do the ensemble average, there are two types of average you can do. One is over X and over time, and then over the ensemble. Right. Absolutely. We have done both. Of course, you know, you can do the restricted X where you really want to find where the two things intersect. But then your statistics go down, you know, because you're only at one point. Okay, so so, so far, uh, I mean, uh, uh, when the nonlinearity is small, you said it goes to the it, uh, kind of it. Uh, it's non-chaotic, and then it's like Edward Wilkinson. Is that? Yes, I did not show you that regime here because it had been studied in great detail in the past. I should also tell you, and probably now is a good time to go back to it and show it again. Uh, that, I mean, this was worked out pretty well by Ayo, Jay Prakash, and Josh Rohn. Uh, uh, these crossover times, I mean, uh, this crossover time and crossover length, they didn't get by brute force. There was a nice suggestion by Zaleski first, which they carried out in. <coughs> Uh, one dimension and then which we did in two dimensions, which is not quite a renormalization group, but a sort of one-shot coarse graining procedure, which allows you, roughly speaking, to map the kuramoto sivashinsky equation onto a KPZ equation. Then that one-shot coarse graining procedure in terms of the uh, correlation functions which you get by running the kuramoto sivashinsky simulation, gives you an effective D, an effective lambda, and an effective nu for the effective KPZ equation. Then you can go back to the old renormalization group for the KPZ and work out the crossover times. And, and note that these are quite long. But when you're doing just straightforward integration in time, your system sizes better be longer than these lengths and before you see APZ. Otherwise, you will see Edwards Wilkinson. Okay? Uh, Abhishek, the sort of circuitous answer to your question. But yes, I mean, you can see Edwards Wilkinson, and this really comes back to haunt you, especially in 2D, where these crossover scales can be exponentially large. So you're saying, uh, like, uh, irrespective of the no strength of the nonlinearity at sufficiently long times or and uh, large system size, you always go to eventually you go to KPZ. Yes, as you must, because that is relevant. Lambda is relevant, right? Any further questions? If not, let's thank the speaker again.